So my oldest, our, our, our oldest, or no, sorry, our youngest, Sage, he's now about uh, 20 months old, not yet two, but he's finding his voice and he's staking his claim in this world. He, uh, Crystal caught him standing up on his booster seat, which is on top of the chair, so he was up there and he's not very stable. And she says, Sage, sit down, we don't stand up in our seat. And he looked at her and he said, no, I stand. <laughs> kid. <laughs> you don't do that for two reasons. One, you don't talk to your mother that way. And number two, you don't talk to a woman 29 weeks pregnant that way. <laughs> I know that. He can't read the signs, though, so it's not his fault. That's, that's what catches my attention um, out of this gospel more than anything else, is that verse uh, 56. There's a lot you can talk about in this gospel. But when Jesus calls them hypocrites, and we would understand hypocrites slightly different than it was used then, I think we should understand hypocrites in the scripture, this part, as somebody who uh, can't discern what's right in front of them, right? And uh, he says, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but you, why do you not know how to interpret or to read the present time? He's saying, people, you can tell the weather, but you don't know what season you're in. Essentially what he's saying. This gospel of Luke is all about changes. The world getting turned on its head. That was announced in Mary's Magnificat at the very beginning of Luke. When he says, the low, you know, the lowly are going to be raised up and the mighty brought down. Everything's getting turned over and people, they can't see what's happening. They don't understand it, probably is a better way of, of saying it. I'm not so sure that I'm different in that regard, because I am firmly living locked in fear, oftentimes, of this, that, or the other, fear that keeps me from seeing the world the way that God does, or the way that God calls us to. I mean, I think, and I think we, we feel this way, we feel following religion might help us to avoid suffering or disaster or disease or even death. Bad theology has ruined that part of our mind, the way it works. That's not, that's what people in Jesus' day thought as well, and that's not the case. If you don't think there are still remnants of that today, then you've never asked the question, why would God allow this to happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? Why would God allow someone to open fire in a Walmart in El Paso or in a club in the 80s? Humans have always wrestled with questions like this. Questions like in Jeremiah, is God, God would say, am I God nearby or a God far off? Where is God in the midst of that? And the mystery is that when God chooses to put on human flesh and blood to touch and be near to us, we could only see it as if through a mirror dimly, as the Apostle Paul writes. So we couldn't quite discern what we were looking at. We couldn't see what was happening. We knew the weather, but we couldn't interpret the present moment of what was happening. And the fire that Jesus mentions in here is not a fire meant to increase the fear in us, but it's about bringing into existence something that is new in this world. It's about a refining. And the refining hurts for those of us with a lot of impurities on us from time to time. It's about that refining, a dying to the old and a raising to new life. That's the story of Christ. That's what it's about. And fire also means God's presence. Where there's fire, there's God. Where there's God's presence, there's also the ability to bring change. So when Jesus says, I came to bring fire and how I wish it were already kindled, that doesn't describe a God with an itchy trigger finger, folks. It's a fire that Jesus wants to kindle is the fire of change. It's a fire of wanting God's active presence in this world. Jesus reveals to us God's intense desire to care world's well-being. That's the urgent, the urgent
urgency that God longs for and how God wants change to happen in the world. Now, why doesn't that happen? <laughs> well, there's division. <laughs> there's division. That's part of following Jesus is going to be divisive ways that we see things. Our society is more divided now than ever. With people, I would say, trying to see, trying to interpret the present crisis, crises in our time. And you can add to that list whatever you think is important or passionate to you, whether it be the environment, sexism, racism, gun control debates, immigration, right to life stuff, all of this, these sides. And what happens is when one side doesn't agree with another, the sides get furious at one another. I mean, I, I, I confess to you that I don't know always how to interpret the present time. And people who think they do sometimes scare me a little bit. <laughs> how can we possibly then see anything together? How then are we to live into God's longings together as a people of faith? Hebrews helps me a little bit. Describes, and I know Phil talked about it last week because it was part of the readings too, the great cloud of witnesses, right? It describes, it, and I've heard some people describe it as like a, a, a cord of faith that ties all of the faithful together, ties it to us. And finally, that cord of faith is anchored in Jesus Christ, anchored to that perfecter of our faith, the one who, instead of joy, takes on the cross, takes on the shame that is there, so that, that, that in that moment of death, Christ could say that moment of death is the lonely end to living blindly in this world and not seeing the way God does, and to say that this is the moment where God will change that with a resurrection heart change that cycle in this world. And so we run this race of faith together. And it's a marathon, not a sprint, so there's bumps along the way. We run tied together, not divided. And we are finally only made perfect when we are in faith together. In the end. I remember this was from a few years ago. Holden, my oldest, was, I think he was about three at the time. And he was great at stalling at bedtime. <laughs> I would, I would, he would ask all these questions. I just wanted him to go to bed so that I could go on and finish what I was working on. <laughs> but he would ask, start asking about people in the family, what was happening tomorrow, what about this, what about that. I'm like, Holden, go to bed. And he just wouldn't do it. He'd keep asking. Finally, at one time, I remember I was sitting there, and I was like, go to bed, go to bed, go to bed. And he said, wait, did you hear that? I heard an owl. And I said, whatever. <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, yeah, that Mr. Owl was saying goodnight, but he's going to bed like you should be. And he was quiet for a minute, and he thought, no, I learned owls live in the night. He's not going to bed. I was like, oh my gosh, you're too smart for your own good. Bed, right? went to bed. <laughs> next night, next day, I was trying to finish something outside before the sun went down, and so I was kind of hustling, and I kind of rushed out to pick something up, and I went over by where his window was, and I brushed by the, 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 the bushes right outside his window, and this big owl flew out of the bushes <laughs> and flew across the yard and out into the field, <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was my there's no way I could have seen what he was seeing my head was filled with my own stuff my own wants my own desires my own thoughts I couldn't see the way he was seeing the world this passage reminds me I'm right in that gospel reading I am right with those hypocrites I need someone to show me what I cannot see. And 
each of you in, in this community, you show me that faith by the way you live it out, by the way you care for one another in this world. You show me belief when I need to see it, and I try to show it back in whatever way I can. So how do we see this present time together? We can see that urgency that God has. This time slips away. And perhaps the good news of this passage really is that God has an intense desire and longing for the world's well-being. And that gives me hope. I think it gives us hope. Then we can see that this is a time where we're going to need one another. To show one another things. We need to hold on to one another, even amidst divisions, that when that veil of truth gets pulled back from our eyes. Because the faith talked about in Hebrews is only perfected in the end when we care for the well being of the other. And when we do, if just perhaps but for a moment, we experience the holy and our longing. Thanks be to God for that gift.